And all the time. God is good. Amen. Amen. He is good. I hope you've had a blessed week. I hope it all has gone well with everyone. And um, the Lord's just so good to us every day we live, isn't he? Amen. And uh, just so thankful for another opportunity that we have to come out and to worship and to be with him. And uh, If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn with me to Jeremiah. We're going to go to Jeremiah chapter 1. We're going to read verses 4, 4, 14, and then verses 17 through 19. We're going to talk about something this morning that uh, hopefully it's not going to get any of you, but it's something that God's given me, so I want us to get right on into it this morning. And the title of this morning's sermon is <coughs> Stop Making Excuses. And we're going to talk about Jeremiah here. And what he ran into. And there's five points that we see in these scriptures that we need to apply to our lives today and stop making excuses. We live in a time when we need to be about the Father's business and we need to make sure that we're not making excuses. Let's read our scripture. Jeremiah Chapter 1, starting in verse 4. Then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou comest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Then said I, A Lord, God, behold, I cannot speak. For I am a child. But the Lord said unto me, Say not, I am a child. For thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee, and whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. Be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words into thy mouth. See, I have this day set thee over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out and to pull down and to destroy and to throw down, to build and to plant. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Jeremiah, what seest thou? And I said, I see a rod of an almond tree. Then said the Lord unto me, Thou hast well seen, for I will hasten my word to perform it. And the word of the Lord came unto me the second time, saying, What seest thou? And I said, I seeth a pot, and the face thou of is toward the north. Then the Lord said unto me, Out of the north an evil shall break forth unto all the inhabitants of the land. For lo, I will call all the families of the kingdoms of the north, saith the Lord. Now, let's go down to verse 17. Thou therefore gird thy loins, and arise and speak unto them all that I command thee. Be not dismayed at their faces, lest I confound them before them. For behold, I have made thee this day a defensed city, and an iron pillar, and a brazen walls against the whole land, against the kings of Judea, against the princes thereof, against the priests thereof, and against the people of the land. And they shall fight against them, but listen to this, but they shall not prevail against thee, for I am with thee, saith the Lord, to deliver thee. You know, we are skillful and are of the art of making excuses, aren't we? People will say, I don't know how. I don't understand. I can't find the right tools. I threw out my back. I have a doctor's appointment. There's been a death in the family. I have a relative coming and I need to get picked up and get things done. When I get up in the morning, um, I, I, I just, I didn't feel good. I was having the trots and couldn't get off the job, but it'll be okay. You know, in the Christian world, we can find all sorts of excuses not to obey God's voice. Amen. 
People have even said to me, that's the preacher's job. It's not my job. I've already served. I've already done. I'm too busy or I'm too tired. And it's been said, excuses are tools of the incompetent. And those who specialize in them seldomly go very far. Benjamin Franklin wrote this. He that is good for making excuses is seldomly good for anything else. So we need to be careful about making excuses. We need to be very careful. And Jeremiah that we just read, he had an excuse ready when God called him to be a prophet. We just read that. His excuses are often our excuses for not doing God's work and hearing his voice. Countering his excuses was a promise from God, and that's what we just read. For every excuse that Jeremiah had, God explained to him what? Well, let's get into those. Number one, he excused that the task was demanding. That was Jeremiah 1 and 5. Because he was called to be a prophet of the nations. Not a priest. His father and his grandfather were priests. But he was a prophet that was chosen. An authorized spokesman for God to declare God's word to the people. And we often think of prophets as people who can tell the future. But a prophet spoke messages to the present that had future ramifications. Being a prophet was more demanding than serving as a priest. And the reason why the priestess, the priestess duties were predictable as you study. Everything was written down in the law for the priest. But the prophet never knew from one day to the next what the Lord would call him to do or say. So it is a demanding task. You and I have the task of doing what God calls us to do. And from one day to the next, we may not know, but we need to be ready for the task and not have the excuse. This task is too demanding. Amen. Because God won't give you anything that he won't equip you for. That's right. The priest ministered primarily to individuals with various needs. But the prophet, on the other hand, addressed whole nations. And usually the people they address didn't want to hear what the message was. So you see, the priest and the prophet had a much different role. And when he told, when God told Jeremiah, I've called you to be a prophet, he immediately started making his excuse. And the first one was, the task is too demanding. How many times when God has called on you, have you said, the task is too demanding? I don't think I can do that. Well, let me tell you something. God wouldn't call on you to do it if he didn't know he already had you prepared. Amen. God may assign you a demanding task, but his call keeps us going when we don't want to go and you're ready to quit. Sometimes God wants us to do something. We have, folks, the promise of God's purpose. In Jeremiah 1 and 5, he said, I chose you before I formed you in the womb. I set you apart before you were born. He already told him right there. I already had this for you to do. And this carries out the ideal of the recognition and the worth and the purpose of him who is known. God knew Jeremiah. God knew you before you were born. The Bible says so. He had a plan and a purpose for you before you were born. So we need to stop making excuses. The promise of God's purpose allows us to let go of our own plans and receive God's plan. That's the key. Like Jeremiah and Jesus, we need to accept that our future is not our own. We're God's. He has a distinct plan and purpose for our lives. When we were growing up, we all had these big ideas about what we were going to, how our life was going to turn out. Did you not, as a child growing up? But we didn't take into consideration the fact that once we become His, He has a plan and a purpose for our lives. The second excuse that Jeremiah gave him is my talent is inadequate. In Jeremiah 1 and 6, he said, oh no, Lord, I'm paraphrasing. Oh Lord God, I don't know how to speak. Since I'm only a youth. He used his youth as a crutch. Jeremiah felt inadequate as a public speaker. 
And there's another character in the Bible who shared this excuse. Do you know who it was? Moses. It was Moses in Exodus 4 and 10. He told the Lord, he said, I can't speak. I'm not a public speaker. But guess what, folks? You cannot say your talent is inactive because, number one, God gave you that talent. So he's going to prepare you, and he's going to have you ready to fill what you need to do. So don't use the excuse, my talent is inadequate. When they heard the news that there was a young man, and, and it, was, it was an awesome story. I love the way God gives me things that I find to tie into the sermons. But there was a young man that was called to preach. And most of the people in his hometown thought that, that whoever told that story had to be making a mistake. That this young man was called to preach. And they would say, surely you don't mean he's been called to preach. It must be someone else. And the reason for that is because he, he said he felt very honored but very inadequate. And it didn't help with what people were telling him when he found that when he mentioned that he had been called to preach. He didn't have talent. He knew that. He was quiet. He was a very shy nature. He was very inverted. And even the pastor told him that um, he said... He was inferior. And he said, maybe you've missed your calling. And even one of his sisters led him and said, you know, he said, she said, I just wanted to tell you that I think maybe you've missed what interpret what God wants you to do. He might have something for you, but I don't think it's called to preach. Now, talking about making somebody feel inadequate, but he said he knew that he knew that he knew what God had called him to do. And let me tell you something. If you will follow through on what God tells you to do, you don't have to worry about your talent being inadequate. Amen. God has a way to overcome our weaknesses, our insufficiency, doesn't he? Right. You know, I've learned over the years that we have to be aware that we are in inadequate within ourselves. But through Christ, the Bible says, I can do all things who strengthens me. Amen. <coughs> when Wilma was going to beauty school to become a beautician, Katie was like maybe, I guess, three. About three years old. And Wilma was studying all this stuff, and she's just, and one day they were fixing to do something in the school, and Katie was there, and Wilma said, I just can't do that. And little Katie spoke up and she said, yes, Mama, the Bible says I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You and I have to understand that we may have inadequacies. That, but what those inadequacies does is causes us to rely on God. Because his strength is made perfect through our weaknesses. His glory is manifested through my flaws. Otherwise, Donna would try to do things on her own within herself and I'm not capable of that but my talent is, I can't use the excuse that my talent is inadequate when God gives me something to do because even if we think that our talents are inadequate God always equips those he calls God's not going to call you to do something he's not going to equip you for we have that promise of God's provision in Jeremiah 1 and 9, he said, Then the Lord reached out his hand, touched my mouth, and told me, I have now filled your mouth with my words. Folks, the touch was not so much to purify as it was to inspire and to empower. It was the symbolic of the gift of prophecy that he was bestowing on Jeremiah. Jesus experienced this touch in a visible yet profound way himself. Because when Jesus was baptized, immediately coming out of the water, Matthew 3 and 17, it says the heavens opened and the Spirit of God descended on him like a dove. And God spoke, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. See, God don't bless the silver tongue orator or the one who thinks that they are something. God doesn't always use the most gifted and talented person. But he uses the one who is touched 
by his hand. Amen. He uses the most unlikely person to shake up a church or a community or a nation. Don't ever underestimate the power of God's touch, especially when God is touching you. The third excuse that he used was the time's not right. Jeremiah 1 and 6, what did he say? He said, God, I'm just a youth. I'm just a child. Well, unfortunately, the word youth rendered in the versions of the Bible referred to children. And it denoted a young unmarried man in his teens or early 20s. Now, most scholars, when I was running some reference on this about Jeremiah, thought that Jeremiah was about 20 to 25 years old at the time of his call. And his reply is not so much revealing his age as his deep sense of immaturity. He felt inferior, folks. He felt inexperienced, intimidated by the task that God was summoned to. How many times have you felt like that God has summoned you and had called you to do something and you felt so inopportune? Like, God, this is not right. I'm not ready for this. Well, his time, his call may come at what you think is in an opportunity time, but he never sends forth his servant alone. He's with you. We have the promise of God's presence. As Joe just said this morning, you know that song, he's never too late. He's right on time. When he sends you to do something, his timing is what is right. And you don't have to worry about the time and not be right. Just trust and do what God tells you to do. Because in Jeremiah 78, he was telling him, he said, don't be afraid of anyone. For I'm going to be with you to deliver you. That was a declaration from the Lord. <coughs> See, before Jeremiah could experience God's presence in talking, he had to go where God sent him. He had to say what God told him to say. And he had to reject fear. Someone once said, when God calls us to a task, he doesn't give us a roadmap to follow and then leave us to our own resources. He walks with us. Right. His presence gives us strength to stand in the face of assault. God will not tell you to do something if the timing is not right. He knows what's best. Jesus felt that same presence. He and the Father were one. He could go on through all that he went through when he was here on earth. Why? Because God walked with him. You know, what a difference it makes when we are being sent and someone is going with us. We know we don't have to walk the lonesome road alone, that we have somebody with us. You are never alone. I have learned since 13 years ago, this next month, when Jimmy <coughs> went home to be with the Lord. Yes, I went through grief, and yes, I went through sorrow. But it was not too terribly long till I realized I was not alone. I had my Savior. I had the Lord to walk with me and to guide me. You and I are never alone in the time in Israel. The fourth excuse was the teaching is dangerous. Because the Lord didn't give Jeremiah a joyful message of deliverance and then announce. Consequently, Jeremiah would be misunderstood. He was telling him that. He was going to be misunderstood. He's going to be persecuted. There was times when he'd be arrested and imprisoned. And more than once, Jeremiah's life was threatened. See, people don't want to hear the truth. And Jeremiah would tell them plainly they were defying the Lord, that they were disobeying the law, and that they were destined for judgment. People don't want to hear that today. When we tell people, when we are honest with people, even out of love and say, look, I love you, but you're not walking the right walk. You're not thinking the right thing. People don't want to uh, adhere to that. And in that scripture, God used the image of a bowling pot to communicate that there was wrath coming. That was in Jeremiah 1 and 13. And he said, again, the word of the Lord came to me inquiring, what do you see? And I replied, I see a bowling pot. It's lip tilted from the north to the south. You know, the Jewish homes would have a fairly 
large, from what I understand, and correct me if I'm wrong, because Nancy probably knows about this, a big wide mouth washing or cook pot that they use. And the unusual thing about the pot north, that this bitch in here, that the pot could be at any moment spewed to its boiling contents. And, it, and with that, it could scald you. And this pot, when he mentions it here, represented and talking about the north and the south, it represented the nation of Babylon that would invade and conquer Israel. And the reason for the judgment was Israel's idolatry and rebellion against God's righteous will. And Jesus' teaching contained mercy and judgment, grace and punishment. And Jesus was teaching to them was dangerous. In fact, it was his teaching that cost him his life. And when God says through us that what we're doing may be dangerous, he will still give you the strength. The teaching is dangerous, but he will give you the strength to endure. We have the promise of God's prevailing. Today, I am the one who has made you a fortified city, an iron pillar, a bronze walls against the whole land. This is 18 and 19 we read. Against the kings of Judea, its officials, its priests, and the populations. They will fight against you, but never prevail over you, since I am with you to rescue you. Folks, that's a promise from God. It was not just for Jeremiah. It is for you and it is for me today. If we will follow and do what God's called us to do, he will stand with us. He will prevail for us. He will help fight our battles. Amen. But we have to be obedient and we have to stop making excuses even when it's dangerous. Amen. God reassured Jeremiah. He's telling him, attack you, they will, but overcome you, they can't. Now, let me say that again. Attack you, they will, but overcome you, they can't. If you and I are doing what God's called us to do, and we're not making excuses, and we're doing his will, people will attack you. They can continue to attack you, but they won't prevail over you because God is with you. The person... You, me, whomever that will stand with God will prevail. Someone said one time, one with God is a majority. Alone we are helpless. But with God, we will prevail. You know, in the days of the Roman Empire, the great Col <coughs> Colosseums of Rome was filled to capacity with spectators coming for their state games. And one of the main events, I don't know if you know this or not, was watching human beings battle against wild beasts or against one another until one or both were dead. And the crowd found its greatest delight in the death of a human being. Isn't that crazy? And when Harriam was emperor of Rome in A.D. 404, as the vast crowd watched the contest, a Syrian monk by the name of Telemachus, and I'm not exactly sure I'm pronouncing that correct, he leaped onto the Colosseum floor. And he was so torn by the ultra disregard for the value of human life, he cried out, in the name of God, this thing is not right. In the name of God, this thing must stop. And when he did, it said the spectators became enraged on this courageous man. They mocked him and they threw stuff at him. <coughs> And it said, caught up in the excitement, the gladiators themselves attacked him, and a sword pierced him, and he fell to the ground dead. And when he fell to the ground dead, it said the entire Colosseum fell silent. For the first time, the people with the insoluble bloodthirst recognized the horror of what they had called entertainment. And it said it kindled a flame in the hearts and conscious of thinking persons. What are you saying, Donna? There may be times, and there have been many martyrs who have lost their lives putting forth God's word and doing what God called them to do. 
But I can assure you, even if that were to happen, his death was not in vain. It helped people to see truth. I'm a winner either way, whether I go or whether I stay. And we've got to stop making excuses. And we've got to keep on the teachings of Jesus Christ in the midst of such a crucial, cruel, and such a bad world that we live in. I'm working on a sermon that says, Stay out of Sodom and Gomorrah whenever the Lord lets me preach it. Stay out of Sodom and Gomorrah. But we have to understand, we have to stop making excuses for why we don't do what God's called us to do. And he was telling Jeremiah here, I will take care of you. The fifth and last excuse Jeremiah had was, do I have to go now? Now I'm sure none of us have ever done that, have we? <laughs> Jeremiah 1 and 17. He was expecting immediate reaction from Jeremiah. God said, now get ready. Stand up and tell them everything I command you. You know, in Jeremiah's day, the men had to tie their loose robes together with a belt in order to run and work. And Jeremiah was in for a fight. He was in for a struggle. He had a fight on his hands. And so the phrase, dress yourself for work or gourd up your loins is what that means. It was a metaphor that means you get ready for action. Today, we call it rolling up our sleeves. Jimmy used to call it pinning back my ears. God was then calling Jeremiah to act. He was called to move out among the people. He was called to deliver an offensive message. He would not be welcomed, nor would he be accepted. He would be angered or hated. But let me tell you something. God expected him. He told him to gird up his loins. And we need to be girding up our loins today. Amen. God expects obedience today just like he did then of Jeremiah. And we need to be rolling up our sleeves. And immediately we need to get ourselves about God's business and stop making excuses for not doing what God's called us to do. We need to not be intimidated. He told him in one in Jeremiah 1 and 17, don't be intimidated by them or I will cause you to cower before them. He didn't have to be intimidated because the Lord was going with him. You don't have to be intimidated today by doing what God's called you to do. Even if people around you don't like it or make fun of you. You know, I have even found myself in the past in my life. And I don't know if the Lord is just making me stronger and giving me more grit knowing that he's taking care of me, or if I've just grown stronger and smarter in my older age. <coughs> but there were many times that I would know things needed to be, but be lenient in what I said to people is to try not to hurt them. Well, I'm for going forward, I'm going to love people all I can love them. I will do anything I can for them, but I no longer will not say, or I will no longer stay silent to keep from hurting them if it's what they need to hear to make themselves a home in heaven. Amen. No more excuses. I have to go. You have to go. We don't need to be intimidated. We need to be obedient. Jesus obeyed. You know, remember, no matter what you think about Jesus, remember this. His heart was such a willing and obedient heart. He did whatever the Father then directed him. Even when he came down to his death, knowing the cruel death he was fixing to face when he was in the garden and he prayed till his blood, his sweat become his blood. Now I'm in the medical field. Diane's in the medical field. Tina's in the medical field. But I have never ever heard of anybody being so distraught that their sweat became his blood. And yet at the end of that, after he had prayed and prayed, what did he say? Not my will, but thy will be done. You and I need to stop making excuses for anything and be about the Father's business saying, not my will, but thy will be done. Amen. Not my will, but thy will be done. Jesus did what his Father directed. 
And you know how he did it? There was no hesitation. There was no question. There was no circumventing. Only immediate action. And this is the attitude that you and I need to take in our Christian walk with what God's called us to do. We need to not hesitate. We need not, we need to quit questioning God. We need to stop circumventing about what we think about this or do that. Just go do what God told you to do. Stop making excuses. The task is demanding. Our talent may be inadequate. We may think the time is not right. And we may know that the teaching is dangerous. And we may even think, do I have to go? But even with all of that, we need to not hesitate, not question, circumvent it. Just go and do what God's called you to do. <coughs> in closing, I ask this question. For all of us to look at ourselves. Dig deep within our hearts and say, has God called me? And if he has, he will fulfill his purpose in you. He will equip you. He will enable you. He will protect you. He will accompany you. He will do all these things if you are obeying his commands. And that's the key. He told Jeremiah to go. And in these scriptures, in this first chapter, all the excuses that Jeremiah tried to give him, God told him why he didn't need to. You and I are protected by our Lord and Savior when he's given us a task to go do. So we need to stop making excuses, folks. We need to get out there. And we need to be sharing his word, helping lead people to the Lord. And then his purpose will be, I can promise you, if God gives your life a purpose, and he does, he, I just read to you where he told Jeremiah, I knew you in the womb before you were ever born. There's not one of us in this sanctuary that God did not know in the womb before we were born and had a plan for our lives. So when that happens, that tells me he will accomplish his purpose through my life if I will not make excuses and I will go forward doing what God's called me to do. And no matter how people respond, his purpose will be fulfilled. He will accomplish what he has planned to do through me, no matter what it looks like and how people are responding around me. Because the Bible says his word will not go out void. So no matter how big the results look or how little the results look, as long as I am doing what God's called me to do and not making excuses and going forward, no matter what it looks like around me, I can promise you he will accomplish his purpose through your life. So look inside yourself today and say, do I make excuses? Am I trying to figure out a way not to do what I know I'm called to do? Or what I need to do. And sometimes on a day-to-day -day basis, God gives you something that day that he wants you to accomplish. And he doesn't want you to make excuses for it. He just wants you to go do it. So as we close today, I tell you, look inside. Make sure that we are not making excuses so that we can be what God wants us to be and the prophet he's called each of us to do. Amen.